Yes. Do you want? Okay, there. Wow. Yeah. We're in the tech section. Okay, I found mine. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, shall we? It's time. Shall we start? Oh, yes. Yeah. It, because that's cool. We'll start. We, you know, then, yeah. You, uh, we can. Well, welcome everybody to the Dynamic Coalition on Gender and Internet Governance. And this is the annual meeting which takes place at the IGF. And at every dynamic coalition meeting, we try to expand the range of issues that we're talking about with relation to gender. So this time we have three speakers. We have Laura from the Dominican Republic. We have Vale from Bosnia-Herzegovina. And we have Baldeep from India slash Germany. <laughs> yeah. So I'm actually going to ask that each of you introduce yourself and then speak for maybe about seven to ten minutes. And then we can have uh, enough time for a discussion after all three of you have spoken. Yeah? So, Laura, would you like to go first? And I'm just going to close this door so that, yeah. Okay, it's working. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. I, I am very happy, actually, because I was a little afraid for my English. But it's a small session, so if I make a mistake, please forgive me. <laughs> well, as uh, Vishaka say, I'm Laura Breton. I'm from the Dominican Republic. Uh, that small island that most of you must know probably because of tourism and the music and probably because uh, we share a border with Haiti. But uh, the situation of the country is not well known in the rest of the world. Um, basically today I'm going to speak to you a little bit about sexual rights in the Dominican Republic, sexual and reproductive rights in the Dominican Republic and how we are using as feminists. I'm an activist, I'm a feminist activist in sexual and reproductive rights. And I'm gonna to speak to you a little bit about how uh, we are using technology to support our fight with the government and with the Catholic Church mainly. And well, let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, I, I come from a country where Three out of ten girls before 18 years old are already pregnant or have a, or have a son or daughter. Uh, most of them are victims of rape. It's not um, victims of rape from family members or older men. And the abortion, abortion is forbidden in all, in all cases, including with the mother is in danger. And we have a lot of cases uh, about uh, girls dying even though they're sick and they're pregnant and we don't have sexual education in schools. All this because of we have a lot of uh, influence from the Catholic Church and lately from uh, other Protestant uh, churches. But the Dominican Republic is one of the few countries that are the last in the world that has a, con it's a country, it's not a contract, it's like a convenio with the Vatican where most, almost 60% of schools are given to the Catholic Church. And the rest, like 30, the other 30% uh, is given to the Protestant uh, churches. So we only have like a 10% of schools that are uh, like us. Uh, how do you say like us in English? I don't know. I think in French, oh. how you say secular. Secular, oh. thank you so much, <laughs> thank you. So it's only like 10% of schools that are actually secular. And so what are we doing? First, let me tell you a little bit. Uh, there, there is an NGO in the Dominican Republic called Pro Familia. Uh, it's part of IPPF. And in 2014, Pro Familia had a campaign online. It was a campaign in social, in social network. Uh, very, in my opinion, it wasn't not that even that uh, new. It was only saying sexual and reproductive rights are rights know them and fight for them. And they were sued by the Catholic Church uh, because one of the videos had a 16-year-old girl with a condom. It wasn't 16, she was like 18 years old and she had a condom in her purse. 
So the, so the shirts say that we were promoting uh, sex, that we were promoting promiscuity, and the case uh, got turned down in court they, for freedom of speech, we were, we were very happy about. But it's still in the constitutional court of our country. And the constitutional court um, hasn't, given any, hasn't given the judgment yet. But it's very interesting because people we know that work there say that it's, not, it's coming and it's not going to be good. They're going to say that uh, Pro Familia was wrong promoting uh, promiscuity among girls. And other thing, I'm working currently for UFPA, uh, for the United Nations Population Fund, and we're working in an app uh, to give sexual education for adolescents. Uh, this has been going on for the last two years or so, and our main issues has been that we have been trying to work with the Ministry of Education. What do we want the Ministry of Education? They have the people, right? That's what we want to go uh, to. And it's been, I cannot say that we've been censured, but they've been putting it so difficult for us. Every time it's like, no, you cannot say condoms. Again, the word condom seems to be the main issue in the country. And the, the presentation of family they wanted us to put, it was a man, a woman, and kids, and maybe a dog. And the only information that we can put in the app was what is a vagina, what is a penis, and this is how babies are made, and that was it. So for a year and a half, we've been going to meetings and talking to them, and they never say no, but they say, oh, that's so difficult. Let's see what we can do. Let's... So last year, what we decided was that we were not working with them anymore, and we got the support of the Ministry of Youth and the Ministry of Health. And now they, don't, they are allowing us to put whatever content we, we decide. And it's been very interesting because we have now like a group of, uh, of youth, of adolescents from 13 to 19 years old, telling us what they want to put in the app. And the information is so different from what we had before. I mean, from when I have a vagina, they want to know, you know, how to have uh, sex in other ways. It's, it's very different and interesting too is that we have a focal group of queer adolescents too now that are giving us more information of what they need in the app. The app is being, um, now is having a lot of support from, from, the, from all the uh, people we wanted to get to and they're asking us questions. We had a site on the, on the app where they can ask questions and we're going to answer them immediately. Uh, in one week we received more than 200 questions uh, from, mostly from girls. 87% 80, of users of the app uh, are girls. So uh, we're receiving a lot of questions and the last meeting we have with the um, with the, with the cure, queer adolescents, it has been very interesting because now we are looking for information to include about uh, sex uh, from um, non-binary people and other, and other issues, which we know is going to be a problem mm -hmm. with the government. But after we have the support of the Ministry of Youth and the Health uh, uh, Ministry, they say, don't worry, go ahead, we'll, we'll take it. We'll take what is coming from the President and from uh, the Ministry of Education, probably. Um, so uh, more or less, that's what I w wanted to tell you about. I don't know if I still have time. I'm working right now in UFPA. Uh, the Yes, UNFPA. And what's the name of the Plan A app. Plan A app. P L A N E A P P. Did I? Yeah. Let me see how. Uh, that's a E between before a. It's not an. Yeah, it's not an oh, I. Okay. It's an E. Okay. Yes, I think it's only available in the Dominican Republic still. Uh, we, we wanted to close it, but we are working with Mexico and Bolivia too uh, to send the app uh, there. The Mexican uh, group is already interested. And the app has been working too also with Pro Familia 
and other uh, uh, civil organizations, uh, civil society organizations that wanted to be part of it. Our main issue has been promoting it and having uh, the information, as I said before, having the information that the youth wanted to uh, listen to. And I don't know what else, uh, ah, well, I was going to talk a little bit about the campaigns we have about uh, abortion, abortion rights. Um, the civil society has they had taken, the, the Dominican Republic government was the one that got uh, the, last, uh, the last two years. It's been, there is this um, report that say what is the government that is more online. Our government has won for the last two years that is a government that says everything online. It's always on Twitter, the president is in Twitter, the minister is in Twitter, everybody is talking there. So we have uh, taken our campaigns to talk to them in Twitter too. And for the last years in, 2000, in 2013 we had a girl a 16-year-old girl that died because uh, she had leukemia and they didn't uh, provide her the, her abortion. Uh, she was two months pregnant and she, and she died. This, for the first time, uh, the, country is, is, uh, the country started speaking about abortion. Speaking publicly. Obviously the feminist movement was talking about it, we were talking about it in our meetings, but we were not outside you know, talking about in the media and in, on the internet. And lately we have a lot of campaigns. There is one called Voy a Favor. Uh, there is a lot of, another one, uh, Aborto Tres Causales, that is being uh, done with the rest of Latin America, with the rest of <coughs> countries that are uh, the forbid abortion in the three uh, main causes, uh, Chile, El Salvador, uh, the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua, we're working together in this campaign online. Um, and we're doing it, uh, actually, I don't know if you know the situation in El Salvador when a lot of women are, are in jail for having uh, miscarriages. And every 17, they were doing a campaign uh, in abortion. And the Dominican Republic and the rest of the countries were doing the same thing just to support them because they're taking the women out of jail right now. Hopefully, soon. Most of them are out already. So um, I don't know. I think that's it so far. If you have any questions, I'm open to speak to you. Thank you very much, Laura. And thank you also, apart from like sharing the very courageous work that you all have done in this kind of situation, I think it's wonderful that you're bringing in the whole discourse around sexual and reproductive health and rights and sexuality into this IGF, because I haven't seen that many sessions that are officially on the agenda that deal with sexuality. So thanks very much. We'll do the discussion maybe after all three speakers. Okay. So if we could ask Valé to go next, and Valé, if you could introduce yourself as well. Hi, my name is Valé. It's a given name by myself, with the H in front. Uh, so I work with uh, APC for the Women's Rights Program and uh, working on uh, sexuality and the internet using the feminist principle of the internet as uh, the analytical framework. Uh, APC has started it's 10 years with a network that is called Erotics. And Erotics means uh, exploratory, exploratory research on uh, information and communication technology. The TIC is the way in which Spanish uh, say technology, information and communication technology. And, was, uh, uh, and the idea to use a word that, you know, somehow gets your attention, because erotics has a sound and then people project. Uh, it's also, I think, uh, meaningful in a world that is just uh, um, trying to forget the humans have uh, uh, sexuality, that have uh, sexual rights, and that part of our life and our body is uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, composed by our desire, by our exploration, and all the things that are called uh, pleasure. And it started from, from a curiosity. I'm giving a bit of um, background because I think it's important that we always remember that uh, there is always someone new in the room and that uh, we also remind ourselves that it, it started from a curiosity. Uh, because the internet uh, is a visual medium uh, and the internet was uh, hosting and is hosting each and every one. And so the point was how 
diversity, how sexual rights activists, how uh, LGBTIQ community use the internet, uh, play on the internet, but also are backlashed by the internet. And I will, I will always use this singular about the internet, but probably we should use a plural because there are also many internet, even if we are all forced into this, into this big commercial internet, the one of the big, uh, of the, the, the 80s, the one that is making money out of uh, people's data. At the beginning, uh, less, but in the last year, I think that this is uh, the, 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 new, the new element. So uh, erotics uh, has done, uh, has always done exploratory research has worked together with the people in different country organizations, researchers and activists to understand how sexual rights are uh, implemented, enjoyed or mistreated. And the last research that we have done is in, in three countries, in India, in Sri Lanka and in Nepal. And always it's a really a baseline research, so it's, uh, what it provides to you is the understanding. So the first layer is the access. Access is really a way to, to you know, the physical access, the, the, the device or the data you have to pay if you want to, to access or the cable uh, TV that will provide you, but also access to information. So the first thing that is important that we never, and we have always to remember that uh, uh, access to information is still there and it's a primary uh, reason why people go. Go to produce their own content, to contribute to the knowledge that is there, but also to search. And it's a search that is perceived as a free search, a freedom search, when you can look for words that are not spoken in school, because this is sexuality in all its domain is not spoken in school. It's moralized, it's constantly taken off of the table and criminalized. Uh, and what we, we, we realize that with the increasing of technology based on collecting data, and with not an awareness about that, and with also government jumping in the, the business of managing people's data, uh, there, there are more backlash. But I don't want to talk about government surveillance, surveillance but uh, what this data, the center, the usage of data generate. Because those data give the possibility to really go after each and every individual uh, outside of the internet. Because it's very si simple to discover who is who. Uh, especially when there are no policy, no regulation, no legislation, and when the actors are in a fluid connective. And when I say actor, I mean uh, government, company, that can be the telecom company, which are uh, the telecommunication company are the main uh, broker of data and the main, uh, the one that asset, and then uh, the big corporation that are uh, sitting somewhere else in Silicon Valley prevalently, uh, and then peers. And when we talk peers, we are not talking only about the, the ex-partner revenge, but also very important uh, a powerful actor, non-state actor like religious group or other conservative group and groups that uh, give themselves the right to speak on behalf of each and everyone because of some specific uh, beliefs and instrumentalize uh, religions, uh, uh, nations, culture, tradition for specific purpose. I would say control of uh, people. And so when this triangulation happened, uh, data become uh, 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 a harm because this data is used against people. For example, in Sri Lanka, and we know that Sri Lanka is a very uh, specific situation, a very delicate uh, uh, situation with, uh, with a parliament that is disbanded, a new prime minister that is imposed, and then on the brink of uh, anything. So if uh, someone wants to know anything about a person, they can go directly to the telecommunication agency and the, the local ISP provider and get a full investigation, all information, without any needs for the company to inform the person that there is an investigation, a research uh, about uh, them. And then without even having the needs of getting a court uh, order. So when we live in this kind of fluidity of powers that are connected uh, uh, pragmatically and realistically connected to one to each other, we see how that is very important. And the regulation, so the feminist principle, and that's why I'm coming back, have a principle that is on data and privacy, where the user needs to be at the center. This year was the big year celebration of the new uh, general data protection regulation in Europe 
that uh, said that the user are the center. So I would say the level of principle of big success, something that at least opposed among international organization and community uh, issue the feminist and women's rights and sexual rights activists are already you know, pursuing since many years. But, uh, and we saw that on the 25th of May, a lot of websites and other stuff were not reachable in Europe because uh, a company that were not based in Europe didn't take it seriously. I can didn't take seriously the GDPR and so sites were not reachable because they were not uh, having done uh, their due diligence on how to protect the data and ask for an information consent by people, because this is the other part, the consent. Consent of the user uh, to know at each given time what is happening with their own data. Uh, and so data valence, I would say, that is beyond surveillance because it's a specific use of data and then it generates harm. And uh, I will not enter into the domain of violence, but I would just say that there is a very interesting definition of 13 form of violence that had been done by a pool of feminist luchadoras in Mexico, PC had contributed. And there is one that I like very much, it is the omission, one of the form to combat and to recognize if it's a form of gender-based violence, gender again, because we need to talk about spectrum. And it's not the binary, the man and the female, but uh, all uh, the colors of the rainbows in, in a fluidity that can change also in one person's lifetime. So we are not fixed entity. And it's important, and there is this uh, form that it's called omission by regulatory actors. So when we have all this plenty of very generic regulation that prom promise us uh, a redress, a way to be protected, but then you go, and there are no mechanisms in place. So yes, they say that they are against violence or against harm, or that they protect the user data, but then you go and there is no system. There is no mechanism, there is no possibility. It's like, you know, uh, they, there is this wonderful uh, right that's sitting at the under the floors of uh, a skyscraper, but there are no elevator, no entrance doors, and you have there to screen to scream, maybe if you're lucky you have a megaphone, very analogic, but no really power to enter this building and make this. Uh, and I think it's an interesting framework. So just uh, uh, to stay also on some pragmatic, I think it's also important that we start doing also benchmarking of all these company because the internet, and I think it's also important because uh, sexual rights and sexuality is most of the time uh, decided protected or attacked at national level. National legislation are the one in charge most of the time for any, and then international convention. But most of the data are very often sitting outside the country in big, because our research and our global survey says the majority of people use social media. Social media are not sitting in their factory of server, are not sitting in the country, so they are outside the jurisdiction which is to imply this continuous tension between a national and a global. And then a set of variety of companies that can be national, like telecoms, but also has not to be, and all the many apps that we can uh, have. So I think it's important that we also start looking at benchmarking and we go uh, looking at the privacy and the freedom of expression that in our case is really freedom of expression through our body our bodily expression, not the speech, not the obsessive North American uh, right to speech, we're only idea, because we have bodies and our bodies talk for us the way we want they talk to, and this is also expression in, full, in its uh, full power. So I think we need uh, to keep uh, data as the center of our discourse, discourse having this uh, illuminated triangle where we have a corporation or company, governance and peers, specific power of powerful peers beyond uh, the uh, fight or the revenge that uh, an ex can pursue against uh, uh, one person. And then how we benchmark. So we need standards because from principle we need to standards to be able to implement so that we can monitor and to do this in a uh, organize efforts so that we do not reinvent the wheel and each and every one think of its own benchmarks. But we really need uh, to, to have benchmark and standards that we can draw from uh, this big principle, the feminist principle, the human rights uh, business principle, the Yogya Karta principle. But we need to do all the way too so that we can bring back rights and the place that they are. 
Thank you very much, Vale, for bringing in yet another sort of component into the conversation, which is data valence. And again, really reminding us that online, our bodies are becoming data. And the way in which that is being used, right, is very much, I think, part of also the concept, the feminist concept of bodily integrity, autonomy, etc. And something that I think we need to think about in terms of our overall feminist activism. Uh, so thank you very much. Our final speaker is Baldeep. Baldeep, if you could again introduce yourself, and then you have a PowerPoint, right? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. From here is okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm slightly out of place here at the IDF because I'm an academic. I teach English literature at a university in Germany. Um, but I briefly worked with Point of View last year. Um, and one of the projects that I was handling had to do with um, uh, making the report from the gender report cards that we received from IDF 2016. Um, because I was so new to the entire concept of the IDF and everything, I kind of, I did my research, I went back, I tried to figure out exactly what this space is, what are we doing here, um, and then I used that um, in my work. And, and at some point I realized that, okay, like maybe now it's time for us to take stock and really see if the gender report cards have worked the way they should and so on. And Bishaka and I worked together on this. Um, she helped me uh, write the report um, because I, I come from an academic background, a very different way of writing. Uh, so I needed kind of initiation. Um, so the report is ready. We're here now. Um, yeah, so let's start with gendering the IDF. Um, I'll be presenting a comprehensive study of the Gender Report Cards Initiative. Um, next slide, please. Um, so firstly, I, I want to briefly talk about how um, gender has performed at the IDF thus far. Um, ever since its conception, there has been a conscious effort by women's rights activists um, all of us, people like us, to advocate for the cause of gender and its inclusion into the agenda of the IDF. Initially, the main issues highlighted in this context were related to online violence against women, protection of digital rights of women and children, content regulation, censorship, sexuality rights, and creating access to the internet was also a major theme from 2006 to 2009. So we see that the IDF did provide very fertile ground for really bringing gender rights into the formal conversation um, about internet governance. Um, and we also have this DC um, in that direction. But by the time IDF 2009 took place, there was growing discontent with women's visibility in workshops and in the content of the workshops. Um, so there was an urgent need for a tool that could be used for two things. Firstly, to evaluate the IDF's engagement with gender, and secondly, to encourage gendered perspectives that were missing in the workshops. So it was in this context that the GRCs, uh, I'll be referring to them as GRCs from now on, gender report cards, uh, were conceptualized. Um, so briefly, wh what does the gender report card look like? Um, uh, very brief five questions, number of women participants in the room, number of women speakers on the panels, number of women as moderators, and how inclusive uh, are we in terms of gender issues in the discussion, which means it, it, this is split into two questions. Was gender part of the main theme? Secondly, was gender relevant to the discussion in the room? Um, so, so these were the five minimal but crucial questions that the GRCs asked. Uh, the method of filling out and reporting, well, initially it was APC members who filled these out, and then over the years we have diversified. Um, from 2012 onwards, it was mandated that every session organizer has to submit a report that answers these five questions about their sessions. Um, and if they don't do it, they can't secure their slot for the next year's IDF. And then the reports are published on the IDF website and in the IDF. IDF annual report. Um, reporting ang language is English. Report has to be in third person. Um, let me come to what we expected when this initiative started in 2011. It was expected that the GRCs will allow us crucial insight into the figures that indicate gender sensitization at the IDF. They were considered a significant statistical resource that could be used to monitor the level of inclusiveness and diversity at the IDF. It was expected that over the years, we would not only obtain an archive of statistics, but also vital data about the challenges and themes revolving around gender at the IDF. 
Um, so for the purpose of this paper, uh, I went through all the official summaries of gender report cards from IDF 2011 to 16. Um, the initial situation in 2011 was that there was almost negligible inclusion of gender perspectives in the workshops, regardless of how many women were present in the room and on the panels. Um, but now that we had the DRCs, um, there was a sudden awareness of the need to privilege gender inclusion over gender parity, so bringing gendered perspectives into actual debate and discussion. Um, so what the 2011 DRC gave us uh, was unprecedented cross-sectional analysis, both statistically and thematically. Um, our sources were also articles that different APC members wrote about gender inclusivity at various IDFs in addition to the official reports and this gave us a sense of the discourse around gendering the IDF and one could actually see a dialogue developing between the DRC reports and the articles. Um, next slide please. Um, next slide. Um, so I basically took all that information and put it in this table so that it's easier for us to uh, sort of um, so basically, one look at the table tells you everything that you need to know about the four major categories um, organized uh, yearly. Um, so I'm just going to go through the categories and then go into the analysis. So the table shows us the number of workshops that submitted gender reports, the percentage of women among speakers, the percentage of women among moderators, and the extent to which gender mentions were a part of the discussions in the workshops. Um, starting with reporting, uh, the second column, that is how many workshops reported, we see that, um, well, clearly the DRCs fostered increased accountability on the part of workshop organizers. The number of reporting workshops increased to over five times of the initial number obtained in 2011, 16 to 18. Um, now that gender had to be accounted for, workshop organizers too began to think about gender in the context of their workshops. A significant finding of our research was that even as the number of reporting workshops increased, even at its best, only 50% of the workshops have been submitting the reports each year. And we also now have the report for, from IDF 2017 and the number of reporting workshops fell. And that's unfortunate. Um, Can I just add one sure. small thing here, which is, you know, uh, there's a little piece at the bottom of each workshop report. So I think what we're finding is that people are, 50% of people of workshop organizers are filling in the top part, which is mm -hmm. the sort of workshop summary, what it achieved, as well as the gender part at the bottom. Mm -hmm. But f around 50% are only filling the top part, yeah. but not filling that bottom gender part. So they are mm -hmm. submitting a report, but omitting the gender aspect. Yep. So th that's, that, was, that was the next part of photo. <laughs> but that's okay, uh, because I also wanted to talk about a suggestion that Smita gave when I ran the study by her. Um, so basically, if it is mandated that one has to submit the report, how is it that no one is filling these sections in? What mechanism will make sure that no one leaves it blank? A suggestion that came from our colleague at Point of View, Smita, um, she suggested that why don't we make a form which has to be filled in compulsorily, and it just needs like one technical change in the mandate mandate language itself, that is we recommend that the word complete needs to be added to the mandate. So following this, we suggest that in the official mandate which states that organizations have to fill and submit reports, reports uh, the word complete should be added to cover all technicalities and loopholes. But of course, we are open to more suggestions, so come talk to us. Um, moving on to the second category of women panelists. Um, so the reports that I went through, they all uh, had concrete numbers. So they would say that there were four women on the panel or there were two women on the panel. Sometimes they would also give the total number of panelists, so that allows you to do a comparison. I mean, four women sounds good, but if it's a panel of 10 people, not so much. Um, so that's why I found it important to really pull out percentages for like each category. Um, so for speakers, the percentage of women speakers across the years remained in the range of 37 to 46 with no major fluctuations. Um, as you can see, for 2016, I marked some entries as inconclusive. Um, 
This is the second major conclusion or finding of this report. Um, we were able to locate um, this, this problem area, which highlights uh, that there was not a reasonable number of reports with information on speakers that could be used to draw a conclusion about the women who were speaking at that IGF. So for 2016, when I made the report, there were only 17 reports that had viable information from which I could pull out meaningful data. Um, so that means that it's it's just useless information. I, I, ca I can't use it for any meaningful analysis. Um, so among, um, not, not only does this uh, prevent us from making larger conclusions about a particular year, the sheer contrast in the number of reports obtained for each year makes it difficult to compare categorical, uh, categorical results. So I can't even make like connections or comparisons between years then. If, if one cell is flawed. Um, moving on to moderation. So moderation exhibits similar gaps in reporting. Um, women have constituted roughly one third of the total number of moderators at each IGF. At the same time, the fluctuation in the number of reports obtained for each year does not allow one to conduct further analysis, let alone arrive at indisputable conclusions. So um, I mean, I, I tried to rectify these things in the process of writing the study. So what I did was uh, I tried to fill these gaps by experimenting with the online schedule for the year 2016. I went to the schedule, I used the information there to complete the gender report cards that I had. Um, but once I did this, my conclusion was to discourage the use of online data because firstly, these, this information precedes the events themselves. It can't confirm for sure what the attendance at the actual event was like. Sometimes. Speakers change, aren't able to make it. So in the interest of accurate analysis, live reporting is essential. There is no substitute. Um, I also found that the schedule in itself is incomplete and does not really fill all the gaps. Um, secondly, uh, sometimes the numbers according to the schedule were very different from what the report cards said about the same workshop. So that, again, that um, not, not a very firm connection between what the schedule says and what actually happens. Finally, due to the format of the online schedule, collecting and collating information from it proved to be extremely <laughs> tedious and time consuming because I literally had to kind of go through the entire thing. Um, but coming back to the table, um, the stats for the gender mentions show us that gender definitely has its foot in the door at IGF workshops, though in varying degrees. Um, there is a clear progression in terms of making IGF workshop themes and discussions explicitly gender oriented, um, where there has been a rise in the number of workshops that consider gender as their main theme or of some importance, there is a corresponding fall in the number of workshops that do not include gender at all. So that's good. Um, mindsets are changing and the discussion reflects that. At the same time, we definitely have a long way to go since we saw that in the Prime Minister's speech at the opening ceremony, online abuse of youth was mentioned without any specific focus on how online violence against women is an entire problem area in itself. Right? Um, we'll get there. We're optimistic. <laughs> um, next slide, please. That's okay. Um, so um, I'll briefly outline the ways in which the GRCs have been useful. Um, it can definitely be concluded that the GRCs have fulfilled the goal that was expected of them back in 2011. Apart from the insights and information that these reports have provided us, they have also allowed repertoires to add comments related to how gender was handled in a particular workshop and to make recommendations on how the sessions can be made more gender sensitive. Um, the GRC has managed to both report and encourage an understanding of women's participation that grew from women as spectators to seeing them as key players in internet governance. It also helped that the GRCs became institutionalized in the IDF quite early on, and this is something we need to continue to push for. But the obstacles at the same time were that some things did hold back the real potential of this model. Not all workshops have been submitting reports or have been submitting incomplete reports, which does not provide the true picture. Um, while the GRC format is successful, actual reporting needs to be strengthened. Additionally, now that we have identified the areas that gender is yet to step into, so we see that you know, in certain kinds of workshops there isn't a lot of gender um, engagement, we must send attendees to these particular sessions so that at least gender-oriented questions can be raised while we separately work towards getting more women on these panels. To conclude, um, next slide, please. 
Coming back to the paper, what we hope to achieve with this study is that, so here's the thing, we listened closely to what the DRCs tell us and what the discourse around gendering internet governance has been. Catching onto problem areas that have been signaled by these sources, the study organizes this archive to draw meaningful conclusions. This is an attempt to take stock, review what it is that the initiative achieved, what still remains to be done, and as part of the recommendations, um, I also plan to recommend a new model of reporting. That way, the report that's prepared for each year is easy to, it's easy to compare between years because all reports are following the same format they have the same priorities in terms of specifically which figures are they focusing on what is the mode of representation like I've I saw that a, a report from one year would use pie charts but the next report would shift to bar graphs and it's just it's difficult to compare across years uh, with that kind of uh, mismatch. Um, and this also includes a suggestion that the DRC model should also include information on the same categories, but on both micro and macro levels. That is, we should have stats for the number of women present as participants, speakers, moderators, against the total number at each workshop and the IDF itself. Um, so total number of women participants in specific workshops, but also total number of women particip participants at the larger event um, against the total number that the footfall at the event, um, irrespective of gender. This helps to represent information in terms of percentages. Um, in addition to this, it is important that each GRC report contains information on what percentage of the total workshop submitted reports for a particular year. All of this will be included in a model of reporting along with the standard format that each yearly report should ideally adhere to so that comparison across years becomes easier. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to all the speakers. Actually. Yeah, really. And thank you very much for doing sort of this background, you know, really working on this research paper. I think there's still a little piece of it left mm -hmm. that's still sort of in a draft stage. We so would like to do some... <laughs> We will, I think Baldeep intends to do some interviews as well yes. as send it out for peer review, etc. And then we hope to finalize it. So may I now ask if people have any questions, comments, thoughts for any of the panelists, if we can have a discussion because we have about 20 minutes left. And yeah, and it's been actually really rich sort of getting three aspects of gender and internet governance into the room, right? Yeah. So the floor is open. Mention what the plan is. Okay, I see. Uh, but come and sit. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I need, to go, I need to run to the airport, actually. Uh, I, yeah, I'll uh, give you this mic. Okay. How's that? Uh, well, I came to this meeting exactly a year ago, uh, or one IGF ago in Geneva, uh, to talk about, to propose a joint statement with the uh, Dynamic Coalition for Publicness uh, to speak about right to, be, right to be forgotten, how it can be abused to allow uh, men and uh, sexual uh, perpetrators to uh, hide uh, their doings in the past. In the meantime, in the meantime a lot happened, uh, one of which was the Me Too movement spread uh, to South Korea as well. And we uh, had uh, 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 many flash points uh, uh, within the uh, country uh, where the uh, um, uh, women's group uh, uh, demanded uh, abolition of uh, truth defamation uh, in Korea. Uh, defamation uh, can be uh, punishable mm -hmm. uh, even if it's true. So many perpetrators use that as a threat to silence uh, women, um, you know, who want to uh, uh, make the revelations. Uh, so there was a push to uh, 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 abolish uh, truth defamation. So I want to uh, renew the proposal yes. now with the uh, uh, added mandate for uh, uh, abolition of truth defamation, which is completely in line with the international human rights standard because uh, UN Human Rights Committee in 2011 issued the general comment 34 on freedom of expression, which demanded that 
or uh, there should be defense of uh, truth to uh, uh, defamation, uh, especially criminal defamation. And uh, this, of course, uh, you know, abolishing truth defamation or uh, uh, abolishing right to be forgotten uh, leaves untouched uh, many privacy regulations uh, which concern um, you know, uh, sexually violent uh, material and uh, uh, forced, uh, forced coming out. Um, and uh, I don't know what the political, politically correct term is now, but revenge porno. Uh, we, we need those laws uh, to be uh, enforced, uh, you know, uh, faithfully uh, to the spirit of the law. Uh, but what we are talking about is whether uh, people should be forced to forget the information that's uh, uh, vital for ethical evaluation of uh, um, male-dominated society and the uh, symptoms of it. So the statement is there already, uh, and uh, hope that uh, your coalition uh, you know, work together on the statement. Thank you. Uh, really, I have a 2 o'clock plane to catch, but I, I really wanted to come here. So, so can uh, I just very quickly in two minutes respond to this and suggest, a, so basically what happened is the dynamic coalition on publicness is a fairly new coalition, right? Yes. And one of the things the dynamic coalition on gender and internet governance has been wanting to do is actually work with other dynamic coalitions so that we can mainstream gender for lack of a better word, like really push it further and further into internet governance processes. and. While the draft statement was prepared last year, and while we did send it out for circulation, for comments, we actually received very few comments. So in that situation, we didn't feel comfortable to just finalize the statement. But I think what you've said really resonates, Professor Park. And I also want to say that in India, there was a case recently with Me Too India where a number of journalists spoke out against a really well-known journalist who is now, who was India's Minister of State for Foreign Affairs. And he was forced to resign. He did resign, but he resigned saying that he's resigning because he wants to pursue defamation a defamation case against the first person who one particular uh, journalist who spoke out and in India also we have the situation where there are civil and criminal defamation laws but people in power typically use criminal defamation to go right and again that whole truth question has come up where truth is not considered a defense against defamation so I propose actually going forward this year that now that we have the statement maybe we look at it again with the defamation aspect as well in light of me too and then maybe set up a small working group and have like a webinar where we can talk it through because I think what does happen is we all receive so many things things to review that after a point it so if we could set up like a you know small global working group we'll put out an email to that and we really work on it and get consensus and then issue a joint statement how does that sound that sounds great and uh, um, if, uh, if this uh, I uh, I mean if, if it's helpful I can even join the if I, I can even join this dynamic yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a membership, but I think you should be part. <laughs> Anybody who comes is part. <laughs> we'll have a new category of <laughs> No, but I think the thing is, uh, I think you should definitely be part of the working group so that we can really pull together members from both coalitions and really progress it month by month. And we will also think who at our end can anchor this. You know, and how, and really have global representation. But I want to thank you, actually, because I know we've been discussing this for a while, and it got to a stage and then sort of stopped. And I myself was at a loss as to what to do going forward. So thank you for coming and sort of ensuring it remains on the agenda, and we will take it forward this year. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, considering that I somehow joined already, I'm so happy to uh, be <laughs> sharing information, asking questions, learning a lot. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. I wish I would stay longer, but I really. No, no, but this is really useful. Thank you, because this is a working meeting. Yeah. Okay, so then any other sort of, so this is one thing we definitely want to do this year. I just want to report back on one more thing, um, you know, the, uh, which is also very relevant in the Me Too context. The Dynamic Coalition had drafted a policy on sexual harassment specifically for the IGF, and then again because of the complexities of moving things through the system and perhaps our own ignorance about it. It took us some time to actually get it to the multi-stakeholder advisory group, but we were able to do that this year. And we then got a response from the multi-stakeholder advisory group saying that uh, it, the MAG is willing to consider this policy and feels it's a positive development, but we need to prepare a rationale for why, given that this is a consultative sort of uh, body to the United Nations, why there is a need for a separate policy when several UN bodies already have their own sexual harassment policies. So my colleague Smita, at point of view, has done the background work. And we have gone through numerous UN sexual harassment policies and understood clearly why we need another policy as opposed to just adopting those. And so that is again something that we would like to take forward with the multi-stakeholder advisory group this year. Shmaila, yeah. Um, I, I, th I thought that the discussion regarding defamation was interesting and maybe also take it a bit further because um, uh, uh, obviously um, a truth defamation is a very sort of exceptionalized uh, concept but the wholly the concept of defamation and um, a deconstruct what evidence means, what then truth means, because a lot of times we've seen in a lot of Me Too cases, um, women are unable to establish the truth aspect of it. And which, uh, th those sort of standards, and then we can maybe open it up to a more uh, larger feminist discussion, that, that's a very good point of entry, uh, because um, a defamation we've seen in the, even in the Pakistani context have, has been weaponized, even though a very little defamation cases actually get to the end, but it's always a silencing tool because it'll go on for years, you'll be forced to maybe go to a different city for hearings. So that's sort of just the entire uh, defamation. Um, maybe we can sort of uh, deconstruct it. And the whole concept of reputation and what that means and the sort of feminist critique of it might be a good uh, place to explore. I think that's a great idea. And I think what we might actually have to do is have two separate statements because the right to be forgotten may be overloaded with defamation otherwise, but we will take this on as well. Yeah, you had a comment and then Vale, you had a comment, okay. yeah. Would you introduce yourself as okay. well, please, um, sorry. My name? So my name is Poppy, I'm from South Africa. I'm an IGF fellow. So I think it's actually very great to see a lot of women sitting at the table and just having these discussions. And I see like 95% in this room are women. So I just wanted to say that, um, so yesterday we had a session with uh, this man from Google, I forgot his name, but he was just speaking about how we should not focus on making speeches and having conversations, but we should actually get to the part where we take action. So I have a question, as young people, how do we go about going back to our countries and actually starting having these conversations? So as young girls and women getting involved getting them, empowering them to get involved in internet governance issues and how do we actually come to assess the impact of our conversations and action. Hi, I'm Kathy Gellis. I am um, a lawyer in the United States. I just wanted to follow up the point that was made two people ago about um, the difficulty of proving the truth and say that in terms of what Professor Park was saying about you need to add truth as a defense, that's step one. You also need to shift the burden on the accuser that they have the burden to prove falsity so that 
that will help alleviate a lot of the tension. Um, speaking as an American lawyer, that's the way our defamation law generally works, where the truth is an important defense, but to make it a useful defense, you shift the burden. So make sure that that's part of the ask, that w if you push for reform, ask for both. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, so I wanted to say, I'm Radhika, I uh, am helping rapporteur this and I'm working as a consultant for BPF Gender this year. Um, so one of the things we were talking about in this reporting, right, um, I don't know if this part is taken from the gender report cards, but there are these two questions at the end of every reporting template that we're given. One is estimating the total number of participants and the total number of women, and uh, it initially said a total number of women uh, present, but uh, when we were reviewing this at the Secretariat uh, just before IGF this year, I suggested that we change it from women to women and gender variant uh, or non-binary persons present. Um, but then uh, there's something that I realized yesterday in the Secretariat room while filling out one of the reports that how do we really estimate this? Because if we're talking about like women as the sex, that's again different from talking about women as a gender. And uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the rooms you can't go up to every single participant and say, uh, what is your gender identity? I mean, that's one, I, I was listening to like also what you were saying about why the gender report cards were not being submitted on time, and that's like a general problem we're facing with all the reporting. Uh, we're not getting any reports on time to be able to put out uh, anything. So I was just wondering, you know, constructively to make this go forward, how do we really get, how do we uh, have, what kind of pointers can we give to session organizers to help them collect this data in the first place? Because even right now I'm sitting in this room and I, I don't know how many of us identify as women and I don't know how many of us identify as gender variant individuals or, so I don't know what to put in there in this report and then this report feeds into your gender report card. So, you know. Do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, maybe, maybe just to kind of respond a little bit, because, because, yeah, because I've been, I've been working on the report card for a long time, and I think that the, uh, it, this is super, actually, really, really great to see, and also really great to see the value of it, and to see how it has changed um, through the years, and um, the fight to get the gender report card as something that's compulsory within reporting has not really been, um, uh, yeah, it's not always been so obvious, no? Mm -hmm. um, and I think one thing in relation to the stuff that you're saying about the unevenness in the questions as well is to acknowledge that this is an evolving report card yeah. um, and the challenge that it has in terms of them doing this comparative stuff is becoming clear. But I think one of the evolution that was very important is that it's moving away from counting numbers of people towards counting, uh, towards an analysis of content, yeah. right? And I think maybe in that sense, it's a little bit more, um, uh, that piece of the, the analysis that you did was uh, more interesting for me because uh, IGF Secretariat does an overall statistics of participants anyway. So I actually don't really feel that it's all that necessary to actually measure whether how many people in the room, because it's also a fluid thing, people come and go. But then who's speaking and who's discussing, maybe that's a thing that's useful to actually collect and measure, as opposed to you trying to go like, are you gender queer or are you gender cis? No, it's yeah. a bit funny, right? And then like before you leave, like just doing a survey, like are you cis, are you queer? Like, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think like just to identify maybe are there other indicators in which we might also want to start to examine in terms of like a cross thematic or cross sectional thing, even at a higher level. So in terms of how themes are being defined, um, for the IGF and the sub-themes, like where the gender then gets, like all of the so-called social issues gets clumped together. All of the identity issues get clumped together, but the technical issues has three different themes. So I think these sorts of analysis is also really interesting to do. Yeah, yeah. and to work much more closely with the MAG and the Secretariat to, in terms of, um, and also with people like Radhika, who's working with the Secretariat to see, and that's been instrumental yeah. actually, like working with people in the Secretariat to make sure that the statistics are being collected and that we can also have access and analyze. 
So yeah, yeah. that's like a, a longer, well, a much more, yeah, a really good work ahead. And yeah. since if you're doing work with other DCs, I think it's also really interesting to have a deeper dive into mm -hmm. kind of like the gendered, um, like having a gendered analysis of the work of DCs. Right. Because yeah. that's something we could do, right? Like sure. a much deeper dive on a peer-to-peer -peer yeah. level. So that's another one. And then just while I have the floor, the last thing <laughs> is to also see um, uh, what APA, how the gender DC can do, uh, can collaborate much more closer also with the BPF work. Um, I think that's, that's a little bit yes. of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And I think the gender DC is the one that can play a very useful interconnecting role between DCs to make sure that the BPF work has a broader view. Because I think BPF yeah. is a bit also strained in that sense. Awesome. Yeah. Right. Um, sure. Vale, you had a... I want to yeah. reply on the... <laughs> on the national. Because uh, we have uh, worked support on national level. And there are many national IGF uh, where uh, women's, women, I mean, I really in the counting or gender, it's even not possible. So it's all male panel. They are not part of the community that discuss. And uh, so I think it's important to, to acknowledge the challenge. And then when uh, women's rights activists, se sexual rights activists try to enter this uh, internet uh, governance forum nationally, it's really hard work. So the very often, or very often it's the first uh, time when there is a day zero, just a session to talk about women in tech. So this is the, like the, 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 uh, the consolation prize, and it's a long effort. But I would say that then continues the conversation. There is also a uh, national and regional uh, uh, internet forum, uh, the, um, uh, DC, I would write the, the, the acronym. So I think it's really important. And when we talk about tools, because tools are being given, so even if they cannot be compulsory, but having the gender cards in there, uh, uh, regardless if it's the statistic, the number, or a more content analysis, also at the national level, it's a way to surface the absence. So if the, 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 because the very often national regional IGF ask also for research uh, to international IGF or to others, so having the gender card as a tool also at national level so that the process and everything is part of one system, maybe it also offering a tool to the advocates at the national level, but also working and, uh, through across uh, the board with the different DC to see what, what gender in terms of content and issue is, uh, is uh, spoken, reflected, because this is the, the only way, even if it's a, sh a, a slow pace, uh, to make a first visible and then strategically address the issue that are... Uh, Baldeep, did you still want to say something? Yes, I just, um, I just wanted to briefly uh, respond to Radhika and Jack's comments. Uh, thank you so much for bringing those up. I actually, this is something that I've realized while working on the study because I saw that I have very clear stats for participation, so that, that really isn't a problem anymore. We have women in the room. We did this, we achieved this, we could congratulate ourselves. Yay! Um, <laughs> And I mean, this is my first IDF, and I was um, reporting at a session yesterday. I've been in and out of workshops, so it's been quite a revelation. And uh, with regard to uh, participation, and specifically, and kind of, you know, giving numbers for how many women in the room and so on, I hit the same roadblock. And I, it's also a very delicate issue because, well, of course, it's a shifting category. So, like, how do you really say concretely how many participants? But also, like. I might be a non-binary person, but I might not be okay with being open about it yet, you know? Um, so I feel like that's something that we can put on the back burner for now and kind of give more focus on speakers and moderators and panels, um, specifically because, like, we simply don't have the numbers for them, and there's a reason for that. It's not just, it's not just a coincidence or an oversight. Um, there's a reason why um, report, uh, reporting people are not giving these things enough attention. Um, and, okay, there was something else that I wanted to say, but I can't but recall we are now. But almost out of town. Time, just one so second. Yeah. One, yeah. Just one second. I just, I wanted to ask also if you can include it, like, if, yes, okay, there are moderators, we are in the room, but what rooms? Mm -hmm. And the part, you know, are we just the mod speaking in the children's rights, mm, uh, in the children's rights uh, coalitions <laughs> and stuff like that? I mean, I want us to talk about something else. Correct. I don't want to see the women in the same places in the... Yeah. 
Um, the, the study has a list of workshops where we don't yet have presence. So. Yeah, that's what yeah, I want to know. This is a good resource. I really want to know. Can I say something? Um, hi there, my name is Carolina Caera. I'm with LACNIC, which is the Regional Internet mm. Registry for Latin America and the Caribbean. So LACNIC is essentially the, uh, the organization that handles IP addresses um, for our region. Um, and so we are part of what's known as the technical community. Um, and uh, we also hold, uh, exactly, I mean, we're a community where uh, gender participation is definitely an issue. So LACNIC essentially holds uh, two events per year where we actually have a policy process that defines how um, IP addresses get distributed. And this is also a process of internet governance, uh, how uh, basically internet resources is, uh, are handled. Um, and we're definitely having also sort of a, a gender challenge in our region and I wanted to share that our organization is um, also sort of actively uh, trying to work on the gender balance. Uh, we're currently conducting um, a sort of an initial um, a sort of uh, research to understand why we're having low female participation at our very, very technical events. Um, and we have, say, uh, some 20, that in our uh, good years, you know, we have 20% uh, participation of women. So actually, the IGF to us is like amazing <laughs> in terms yeah. of, uh, of female participation, but we're working hard to get women um, um, sort of participating more actively uh, in uh, sort of the development of digital infrastructure of the internet. Thank you very yes, much absolutely. for that comment. Uh, oh, Lisa, we are, are running out of time, so can you be super brief? Yeah. Yes, just a quick one. Um, I was just thinking about um, having also dynamic coalitions at the regional level of the IGF. Perhaps that's something that could work as well. Sure. I just wanted to answer Poppy's question very quickly. You know, what I would love to do, my personal dream is actually to do like a big social media campaign through the year on gender and internet governance so that we are able to take the concept to young people where young people are and put it in a more popular format because we also know that not everybody will come to the IGF itself and also that it has to relate to people's lives, right? Because when I first got into internet governance, it just seemed like a big word and a heavy word and I didn't know what it meant and what my relationship was to it. So that is actually something that we would love to do at some point and really through the year, like really demystify internet governance and really relate it to gender in a way where it relates to people's everyday lives across the gender spectrum, right? So maybe, but you know, there are so many ideas, such little time. And on that note also, we've been in conversation with a professor from American University who was a, a very much part of the accessibility and disability sessions and who talked about how we could mine some of the data from the IGF documents to get a richer understanding of gender. So we are hoping that that can also become a part of the sort of study of how gender is coming into the IGF and the impact that it's having, etc. Thank you. I want to actually thank all our speakers as well as all the people who intervened and everyone in the room for a really rich and stimulating discussion. Uh, uh, thank you, Valet. Thank you, Baldeep. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Radhika, for rapporteuring and you know giving us the notes. And I'm hoping we are able to get sort of an audio feed of the session as well, or a video feed, because there's so many ideas. You have it, super. That I feel like we may need to actually make a list and systematically start working on them. So we'll find it from there. Yeah. But thank you, everybody, and a round of applause for us all. Yeah.